welcome to service this morning on May Day, and we're going to do something special today. We're going to do a May Day creation service. So all our service today will re re recognize God's wonderful creation around us. I invite those who are able to join me and rise to join me in the call to worship. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. And their voice goes out on the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Please join me in singing hymn number 217, Holy Ground. We have used, abused, and abandoned those things 
You have created for your delight. You have created a fragile world in a perfect and delicate balance. Thinking too much of our own importance, we have upset the balance. We ask your forgiveness, holy and righteous God. We are to join with the mountains and valleys, the rocks and the birds, and the wild oceans in singing your praises. Amen. Please join me in a moment of silent reflection. Stand at the crossroads and look, and ask for ancient paths, where the good ways lie, and walk in it, and find rest for your souls. Amen. Please be seated as we join together in singing Surely the Present. Dottie, 
Ken and Audrey, Diane, Mary, Jen, Tina, Lynn, Sophia, Simona, Steve, Ralph, June, Lil, Marianne, and Robert Stitcher. Are there others who need our joys or our concerns at this time? Then we pray all these prayers and those prayers that remain deep within our hearts in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The first scripture reading this morning comes from the Old Testament, from the book of Genesis, chapter, 20, chapter 1, verses 20 through 31. And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let every bird fly above the earth, across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, of every kind with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the sea, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, and you shall have them for food, and every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life. I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Our second reading also comes from the Old Testament this morning, from the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude too. And on the seventh day God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heaven and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground. But a stream would rise from the earth, and water from the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. 
And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden and in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge, good and evil. A river flows out of Eden to the water of the garden, and from it there it divides and becomes four branches. The name of the first is Fishin, Fishin, and it is one that flows through the whole land of Havelatha, where there is gold, and the gold in the land is good. Vidilla, Mananic, stone, and lead. The name of the second is Gaithan. It is the one that flows around the whole land of Cush. The third river is Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. I invite those who are able now to rise and join in singing hymn number 793, For the Beauty of the Earth. <laughs> for them for food. 
and to every beast upon the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps upon the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. One of the key passages is this. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon you. The dictionary tells us that dominion means domain, supreme authority, or absolute ownership. I would argue that we are not, we are not given ownership over the land, but we are rather given stewardship with creation. Stewardship means the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. That seems a better understanding of our responsibilities to caring for creation, doesn't it? It just sounds better than having absolute ownership. Sherry Mitchell tells us about the indigenous core value called kisi, kisi. I like that word, kisi. And kisi, when you find out what it is, is why I like it, is harmony with the natural world. It, this teaches us that it is not enough to know that we are part of one living system. We must also take active steps to live in harmony with the rest of creation. This means we cannot adopt attitudes or beliefs that place us above the natural world. We cannot see ourselves as having dominion over the land, the water, and the animals. We cannot even see ourselves, she says, as being stewards of the, land, of the earth. We are only keepers. Keepers as a way of life that is in harmony with the earth. Every day we must act in ways that acknowledge that we are part of one living system, one unified whole. This understanding is very different from the belief that beings are chosen above all others. This view creates countless distortions that not only elevate man inappropriately, but also diminish the rest of creation. The world is one unified place, one unified system. It cannot be separated and fragmented into saleable parts, is what she calls them. It cannot be made into saleable parts. The Eurocentric view, as opposed to the indigenous view of property ownership, requires us to see the land as being disconnected from us. This view separates us from the source of life. The indigenous view recognizes the land as kin, as part of the lineage of life that we are all connected to. Thus, we have an obligation to care for the land in the same way that we would care for our human relatives. As Wabanaki people, Mitchell continues, we are taught that it is our responsibility to, pe to speak on behalf of the natural world. Not because we are superior to other living beings, but because we speak the language that other human beings understand. Human beings are the only species on the planet that has fallen out of step with creation. As a result, it is human beings that pose the greatest threat to life. The only way for us to regain our balance with creation is to once again find our balance with the natural world. PC is just a word, but it's a word that reminds us of our deeper connections and our deeper obligations to life. We are kin to creation. How would we change our relationships with the world around us if we started thinking that the animals and trees and waters that we see are our relatives, 
that they are part of us. The first thing I think of when I think of that are endangered species. Here are some animals on the verge of extinction. And when I say these, I want you to think how we would be without these animals. The Amur leopard, the orangutan, the rhinoceros, the gorillas, the red wolf, the pygmy three-toed sloth, the Galapagos penguin, both the Sumatra and elephant, and Asian elephant, the tiger, and the Atlantic bluefin tuna. These endangered species are on the verge of extinction because humans care about themselves only. But it is also critical to conserve these endangered species for the ecological balance. Plus, they are our kin. We are responsible for protecting them. We also have another problem waiting for us. Environmental refugees. Have you ever heard that term? Environmental refugees. This was a new one to me. Those people that have had to move from their homeland because of environmental tragedies. And there are millions of them. The lives of millions of people worldwide have already been upended, never to return to what they have been, never to unfold in ways they hoped for. The charred wildfire ashes in California that were once homes and then washed away by unprecedented torrents of rain and a deluge of mud are but one example. More than five million Syrian refugees fleeing drought, famine, and then civil war is another. Climate change is also is often called a threat multiplier, for it tends to exacerbate other threats such as poverty, the violation of human rights, and war. Will climate change also magnify and multiply our human tendency to respond in fear so that we ignore pleas for help, build walls, and selfishly bunker down and shut out the world. That may be, but we also carry within ourselves a capacity for compassion. Now, here's the big question. What does the church need to do? Does the church need to get involved? And why is it the church's problem? In 2014, the world's largest scientific society, the American Association for Advancement of Science, which includes over 121,000 members, published a paper, What We Know. This makes it clear that climate change is happening now. It is largely caused by humans. It has gotten worse in recent decades, and it will keep getting worse at a faster and faster rate, and humanity is doing little to address it. But this is an opportunity for the church that we were born for. It's important for us, for us to remember that religious leaders and their congregations have played a crucial role in nearly every social transformation. For millennia, it was normal for slaves, for people to own slaves, until Samuel Awal from Old South Church in Boston published the first anti-slavery pamphlet in 1701 and launched the abolitionist movement. For centuries, it was normative to only allow white men to interpret scripture from a pulpit. I wouldn't be standing here today until the Congregational Church ordained Lemuel Haynes and Antoinette Brown Blackwell. History will forever admire Dietrich Bonhoeffer for gathering a group of seminarians at Fickwindahl to prepare Christian leaderships to oppose Hitler. Bonhoeffer's sermons, along with those of other courageous pastors whose voices Hitler could not silence, continue to inspire. And we all know Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. helped to bend the moral arc of the universe 
towards justice by changing the aspirations of a nation. And who could forget Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who inspired scores of clergy to work with him until the dignity and equality of all South Americans was written. These remarkable religious leaders repurposed the church in their time and place. The actions they took were not always immediately successful or even popular. Congregations kept doing what they had always done. They kept doing the same thing, but their movements inspired many people. We hold them up as examples of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Who else do we hold up to be a follower of Jesus? What does this say about our calling in the world? This is a story that I read and I found the news article because this story just spoke to me. On November 28, 2016, an incoming snowstorm pushed a swirl of 25,000 25, snow geese into the vicinity of Butte, Montana, reports the Associated Press. That's about five times as many geese as the city sees in a whole year. And in many places, such a large flock of these bright white birds with black tipped wings would be exciting. But for employees at the Berkeley Pit, a 700 acre gaping hole filled with contaminated water, the incoming geese were a nightmare. That's because the Superfund site is a death trap for the birds. A 900 foot deep, highly acidic, former open copper pit mine contaminated with heavy metallics like cadmium, arsenic, and cobalt. About 10,000 of the birds landed on the water, one of the only bodies of open water in the area, since their typical stopping point at Freeze Out Lake was frozen, report Susan Dunlop of the Montana Standard. Employees worked through the night using noise and flashing lights to chase the geese away. The next morning, the AP reports, employees had scared off about 90% of the geese, but not before many of the birds succumbed to the red color toxic stew. Officials are still tailing the death toll and the AP says they expect the death toll to be in the nearly four digits. Mark Thompson, Environmental Affairs Manager for the mine company, Montana Resources, which manages the site, tells the AP the employees did incredible things to save a lot of the birds, and they really put their heart and soul behind it. They did everything they could think of. It's not the first time beef has, beef has perished at the site. Ben Barino at the Washington Post reports that in 1995, the carcasses of 342 snow geese were collected from that same pit, which ceased activity in 1982. Through Atlantic, Richfield Company initially denied the water was to blame, instead claiming the birds ate tainted grain. Later, they showed that the digestive tracts of the Greeks were covered by sores and blisters due to the acidic water. The site is too large to construct a netting system or other permanent goose deterrence device. So the company began a project of hazing the birds away from the contaminated water, using rifle shots to scare off incoming flocks and large loudspeakers blaring the noises of predators. Those efforts seem to work. According to the Dunlop, Dunlop though 22,000 birds visited the mine between 1996 and 2001, only 75 deaths were reported. Guarino reports that 14 birds died at the pit in to, between 2010 and 2013. The size of the flock this time around, however, simply overwhelmed the deterrent system. I can't underscore enough how many birds were in the Butte area that night. Numbers beyond anything we've ever experienced in our 21 years 
of, or, of orders of magnitude. They did everything they could and they've taken care of these birds. How many of us would take care of birds? We think of that. <laughs> Sharon raised their hand. They are our kin. God gives us everything we need. We just need to trust in God's guidance to take care of God's creation that God made in the beginning. In the weight of climate change, there is so much that weighs on our generation and our churches. It's time for our church to become a prophetic voice in the world again. Amen. The Lord provides everything for us in this life. May we now offer our resources of money and the pledge to live our lives in accordance with your plan. The morning offering will now be brought forward. stewardship over the world. Let us give these offerings this morning to that same world to do God's work. Amen. Please be seated. Please join me in the communion service listed in your bulletin. Once upon a time, God made a garden, and every creature lived in it happily with God. We took long walks with God in the cool in the evening. Humans and snails, kangaroos and spiders, kitties and larks. And when we all sat down with God to eat, the curling's vines gave up their fruit, and tall gold wheat gave up its grain, and we ate delicious bread and drank from a cup, singing under the stars till morning. And the grateful creation was at peace ever since when we honor the earth by eating and drinking with heartful thanks. God walks with us again. God sits with us and eats. Our tables become the garden. The whole creation sighs with peace. And we see again how life was meant to be. Come now, everyone, to this table, to the gar garden God planted in the east, in Eden. Come, taste and remember. Taste and see how good God is. Let us pray. Thank you most of all for Jesus, who sat down to eat and drink good bread and good wine, so that in tasting how good they are, we could remember how good you are. Send the Spirit to this table now, where he still sits up, us down, where we still remember you. As we eat and drink together, let us see more clearly a vision of life as you meant it to be. Dear friends, in, in Christ, this is the bread blessed and broke and gave us to share in remembrance of him.
This is the cup Jesus blessed and poured and gave to us to drink in remembrance of him, eating and drinking together. This is the body of Christ. Take and eat. This is the blood of Christ. Take and drink. <coughs> Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for this meal that nourishes us in body and spirit, for a taste of your dreams, for the earth that gives us these resources, and for these bodies of ours through which you take on flesh. May our gratitude produce faithfulness, and faithfulness produce justice. Amen. We have a few announcements. Um, tomorrow morning, I will send out in the announcements, the Faith for the Future Me uh, Committee has revised the mission statement. So we are going to vote on it at our meeting on May 15th. So I'd like everyone to take a look at it. So at, well, we will send it out in the email tomorrow and then it will be in the bulletin. So if everyone could just take a look at it and be ready to vote on that. The Nifty 50s lunch will be Tuesday, May 10th at 12 o'clock at Otto's. Consistory and Faith for the Future will be meeting May 16th. Uh, May 14th, the Bank on Buffalo will be doing a shredding event. Am I correct on that? This. And in order to participate in the shredding event, you need to bring can donations for our food pantry. So it's the Bank at Buffalo right over here. Over here. Well, wherever it is. The Bank at Buffalo right near us. And they are going to be collecting uh, donations for our food pantry in order to do shredding and then the, the donations are going to come to our food pantry. So if you have any shredding to do, that is a great place to take it. Are there other announcements? Oh, I have two other announcements. We had a funeral here on the 22nd. It was for a church, a member, a the Pastor Katrina, who is way down in Warsaw, called me. She had a friend up here in Buffalo who passed away, and they wanted to use our church for a funeral. So they used our church, and we got two very nice thank you notes, one from the family and one from the pastor for using our church and we got a donation to the church. So I will have Sharon put these up so everyone can see them. But it's the partnership of churches that is nice to do that they called us and they did everything. The only thing we did was Sandy let them in. Are there other announcements? Yes. Oh, yes. If anyone wants to take the lilies and plant them in their garden, they're on the bench outside. So if you want lilies for your garden next year, take them and plant them. Then if that is all, I invite those who are able to rise and join in our closing hymn, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise, number 33. <laughs>
words. As we go forth, may we be reminded of the creative, renewing energy of God. May you be witnesses of the wonder of God's work in the world through Christ. May you be reminded of the possibilities of victory and glory amidst death and despair. And may God be gracious to you and give you peace. Amen.